What we all know is that life has a beginning and life has an end. There was a moment when we all took our first breath and a moment when we will each breathe our last. Yet central to the Christian faith is the conviction that being born isn't the same as being alive. There is a second birth which follows the first. When our eyes are opened, a seed of faith is planted. When our hearts first cry out, Lord Jesus, I surrender. I give my life to you. From this day forward, you alone will be my glory and my all. I desire nothing but you. But seeds are always planted with the hope that they will grow. It's one thing to be alive. Growing into full maturity involves so much more. And like each seed planted in the soil, real Christianity, seen in the life of one who is living in the assurance of the hope found in Jesus, whose faith is bearing fruit, whose love for all neighbors is present in every thought, every word, each action. This also involves so much more. And so we must ask, are we content with simply being alive? Or in all the moments that fall between our first breath and our last, are we willing to follow Jesus into the overwhelming beauty and joy of a life fully surrendered to Him? Well, welcome again. It is, uh, it is great to see you. If we've not met, my name is David. I serve as a senior pastor here. And I got to tell you, the, the fear of every pastor is that no one will come the week after Easter. I just got to tell you, we would just assume. I knew that there would be this many people here. You know, we were doing Sutton's baptism, but uh, it's good to see all of you as we dive back into a theme that we have been in for quite some time. We took a few weeks off for Holy Week. Uh, and I do want to say for everyone who invested and made Holy Week happen. Uh, there's people that you see uh, that, that are you, clearly you think about who, who invest, our, our musicians, uh, uh, orchestra, choir. Uh, we do four services. It's, it's a big week. Two services in a different location, which is a lot harder than it looks. Uh, but also everyone who was at a door who welcomed, uh, everyone who volunteered in, in, in any way, hundreds and hundreds of people make Holy Week happen. And so would you just join me in a moment of celebrating all of those who invested in all of those opportunities? I am, uh, I am deeply, deep, deeply grateful. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to open that to 1 John. 1 John is where we're going to be. We're looking at two passages in 1 John. So if you'll just turn to the beginning there, it's near the very back. So if you get to Revelation, you've gone too far, go back a little bit, uh, you will find uh, 1 first, first John. Uh, we are returning to this theme, real Christianity, and, and this is a theme that we have been in really since, the, since last March. We've done three seasons uh, on this focus uh, with, with three simple themes in each of those seasons. The first one, uh, becoming a Christian, the second season on being a Christian, and this third season on maturing as a Christian. And one of the things that I've reminded you at a, at a few points along the way is that we are using some source material for this. We are using as kind of the foundation of it, our guide in this, uh, something known as the 44 Standard Sermons of John Wesley. Now, for those who don't know, Methodism uh, the, grew out of the 18th century, the movement that was started by John Wesley, who was an Anglican priest, uh, and Wesley's desire, his, his, his desire was to, in his words, spread scriptural holiness across the land. And, and the movement increased, grew exponentially over the course of a very short period of time, in part because of the way that Wesley kind of on the back end made that happen. One of the ways that he did that was he sent out lay preachers, not those who had been, been uh, trained at, with, with great education, uh, but he provided them with sermons that they could preach, uh, sermons that have now become the 44 standard sermons that they could, they could share. And because of that, all across England and all across the colonies here in America in the 18th century, Methodism spread like wildfire. 
And I want to remind you of that in part because that's our heritage. That's, that's part of who we are as the people called Methodists that continue today. But also because what it reveals about uh, Wesley and reveals about our, wo- uh, our roots. Uh, the, the first thing being that, that Wesley's passion and the passion behind our roots was maturity. Wesley wanted people to become Christians. He wanted people to understand what it meant to be a Christian. But more than anything, the passion, the driving force of his life, the driving force of the Methodist movement was for people to experience maturity, to grow as disciples of Jesus. His sense was, in looking at the Church of England that he served, his sense was that we have, been, we have developed a form of religion that lacks any power. People aren't experiencing what they're meant to experience in this new life. And so maturity was his his driving passion. And, And secondly, part of that was his desire for people to have clarity on what that actually meant and how we mature. It isn't something that we do for ourselves, that that the power of the Christian life is the power of the Holy Spirit at work in your life. That's what we spent most of the first half of this season prior to Holy Week looking at how we mature. But here's the third thing, and this is really the theme for all the the next five weeks, the last five weeks of this year-long journey, this final season. The theme that we're gonna look at is that maturity Wesley believed that maturity involves both peaks and valleys. Maturity involves both peaks and valleys. And I hope that that is especially encouraging to you today. I hope that you'll be here for these last several weeks uh, because I believe it will be especially encouraging to you because what we see is that Wesley was, was willing and, and our desire is to step into this same risky place of talking about things that we don't normally talk about. There's this general assumption within the church. Again, we don't talk about this, it's just something that we assume, that maturity is something that, that has a consistently upward trajectory. That it's just something you start here and over the course of your life, you're just, you're just continuing to increase, continuing to grow And that's not really what many of us experience. And because it may not be your experience, again, we don't talk about this, but this is the disservice that we we do in not talking about this. If If it's not your experience, you may find yourself thinking, well, I must be doing something wrong. I'm praying, but I don't know the right words to pray. I'm putting them in the wrong order. I'm I'm reading the scriptures, but it's, it's not doing for me what it does for others. We tend to assume there's, there's something wrong, but, but maturity is, it is peaks and it is, is valleys. Uh, the term that Wesley used for this is he talked about backsliding, the idea that we could progress in our faith and we could slide back in our faith or regress in our faith. We might think of it in the words of that famous hymn we, hymn we know so well, we are prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. And so I want you to hear this really clearly. If you have experienced this in your life or if you're experiencing this right now, you are not alone. You are not alone. What your experience is, uh, your experience is not abnormal to the life of faith, to the life of following Jesus. Uh, you, you are experiencing something that, that many others perhaps here today have, have experienced or are experiencing in their life. We may not often talk about it. Again, there may be this general assumption, there's this, this continual upward trajectory, but I want you to hear if you have experienced this, if you are experiencing this in your life, I want you to know that you're not alone. So what I wanna share with you today is what I hope is uh, an encouraging but also practical message. This is not a normal message for me that I would prepare for you, uh, but I hope that it is practical. It's something tangible that you can take from and will be meaningful for you, whether you are experiencing a valley or as you think about what might come or what you've experienced over the course of your life. So Wesley talked about two different types of valleys. 
And the first one he identified as darkness. That's what we're going to look at today. And the second one was heaviness. And we're going to talk about heaviness next week. But just to give you a sense of how to distinguish between the two, let me give you some examples that Wesley used for what heaviness might look like in our life. First, he talked about heaviness as, an, as a prolonged season of grief, an intense grief that you may have experienced in your life, perhaps the loss of a loved one very suddenly, a family that deals with the loss of a child, it's that kind of grief where the people around you over the course of time, they assume that you should be further along than you actually are and perhaps they don't know how to help. They don't know what to say because that season of grief is continuing for you. He talked about heaviness as a prolonged illness. So you might think of people in your life right now who, who might be in treatment for cancer. They're, they're, they're experiencing in their physical bodies the, the weight of that, the heaviness of that. I remember visiting with someone many years ago who her, her, her whole personality was fun and exciting. And I mean, she was one of those people, you, she walked in the room and it was just like, wow, we're all having fun now. And she's going through chemo. And the hardest thing for her was, I'm, I can't be who I am. I don't feel like I normally feel. I, she, she felt this burden to be for others who she had always been. And part of that season for her was just receiving grace. Hey, you're carrying a heavy load. Those who deal with chronic pain in their life, that there's a heaviness in, in that. And those, those who live in poverty, and there's, this, there's a particular thing you might think of when we think about poverty, but, but essentially this, we're talking about those who work tirelessly and they never get ahead. They're never able to get past the circumstances that they feel, they feel trapped in. Again, that's what we're gonna look at next week. I want you to hear that today because you may know someone who is experiencing a heaviness in their life right now. And if you do, I hope you will invite them next week because again, I think it will be incredibly encouraging for them. If for no other reason, they might walk out of here and what they experience is someone saying to them, I see you, I see you. I understand what you're going through. The heaviness that you are, you are in right, right now. It's not because there's anything wrong with you but it is simply a part of this experience that we, that we call life. So let me flesh out darkness because that's what we're gonna focus on today. I'm gonna look at two passages. So 1 John chapter one, I'm gonna read to you from verse five uh, to chapter two, verse two. So, so listen to these words. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and he will forgive, forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So here's what I want you to capture from that, that first passage. God is light, okay? Not God likes light or God tends to stay close to the light, but that God in God's essence is light. And when we draw near to God, we draw near to the light. So whatever experience of darkness that we may have in our life, it is not the result of God turning out the light. It is the experience of us wandering from the one who is the light. So just put a pin in that. We're going to come back to it. So turn with me to chapter 4. 
And this is the same passage that we looked at about three weeks ago when we just pressed pause on, on real Christianity. Verse 18 in particular, it says this, there is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. So here's how we described that a few weeks ago. We, we talked about that what we see in here is, is John speaking about that within our heart, there, there are only two things that reside there. There is fear and there is love. And, and this is the way that I illustrated that for you a few weeks ago, I've done it several times. Uh, if you think about this, this glass vase as the human heart, these ping pong balls, which by the way, I found out three weeks ago, these are actually high quality ping pong balls. I had no idea, but they pointed that out to me. I was very pleased to hear that. And I'm pleased that no one has stolen them because they are high quality ping pong balls. I probably shouldn't have told you this, but I just did. These represent fear in our life. And fear expresses itself in our life in a variety of ways. Fear expresses itself as pride. It expresses it, itself as anger or insecurity or, or shame. There's lots of different expressions of fear in our life. The water represents love. And if you were here a few weeks ago, I'm not gonna do this today because I've already made a mess and don't need to do it again. If you pour more water in here, the, the ping pong balls rise up and they leave. And, and this, is, this is what John means when he talks about perfect love driving out fear. That as love is poured into our life, holy love, which is a gift of the Holy Spirit, the fear, fear which is the origin of all sin in our life, fear is naturally removed from our life. So, so here were kind of the key ideas that we looked at with this particular passage in this illustration, that perfect love drives out fear. The original source of sin in our life. The second thing being, you don't remove fear to make room for love. You actually can't do that. That's not possible. You don't remove fear to make room for love. Love's power, what makes love powerful is that it drives out fear and the constant work of the Holy Spirit is filling you with holy love. So as we were talking about this this week with our, with our team that, that works on our, on our messages, one of the comments was, you know, I'm not sure we know what we mean by fear. So let me give you an example. Uh, you, you may have heard this, this joke before that m for many people, their number one fear is public speaking. Have you heard that? Like that's top of the list, which means that if they were to go to a funeral, they would rather be in the casket than being the one who gives the eulogy. That's, that's what that means. Thank you, Jerry Seinfeld, okay? But the fear isn't public speaking. The fear is public humiliation, all right? Do, do you understand the difference? It's not about, will, will words come out of my mouth? Will the microphone work or anything like that? It's about how my words will be received, okay? So it's, 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 how, it's how that affects us. It's how we understand the, the vulnerability that creates for us when we think about fear. Here's the best way that I can think of to describe what we mean by holy love. Holy love, receiving holy love is learning your name. And your name is, it's the same name I have. Your name is beloved. Your name is beloved. And so as you receive holy love, as holy love is poured into your life, you become more grounded in who you are, your identity, your name. You are the one who is loved by God. And so the fear that is within us all, the fear that we might be rejected, the fear that we might not be good enough, the fear that we might not live up to expectations, whatever it might be, that fear is driven out of our life because we recognize that before we have done anything, God has claimed us and called us by name, a name that is beloved. You are beloved of God. So this is how we mature. This is how we grow. This is how we talked about it for four or five weeks before we took a break for Holy Week. Here's what we didn't talk about. Again, it's not just an upward consistent trajectory. 
what happens when things start moving in the opposite direction. If maturing involves both peaks and valleys, if backsliding, if regression, if a tendency to wonder, if that's a part of who we are, in the same way that love drives out fear, if love decreases in our hearts, the natural impact of that is that it increases our fears. I'll say that again. If love decreases in our lives, then the natural impact, the natural impact, don't miss that phrase, the natural impact is the increase of fear. So here's how Wesley describes some of the things that lead to love decreasing in our hearts. So this is his language. He talks about sins of commission and sins of omission. So you might think about it this way. These are the things I say or do, that would be the the sins of commission. Those are active things. It's what I said, it's what I did. Sins of omission are things I fail to say or I fail to do. So, in other words, if if I act upon the impulse, whatever that might be, that is a sin of commission. It's, It's something that is seen, it's visible. But omission is something that is not necessarily seen, and it's an opportunity that for whatever reason I missed. It's a word that I didn't say. It's something that I didn't do. It was my opportunity to to see someone, and instead I looked away. A a chance to hear, but but for some reason I I closed closed my ears. It was a chance for me to speak a word of grace, and instead I I remained silent. I didn't say what, what I should have said. He, he talks about one of the causes as being inward sin. So, so pride and anger that festers in our life. Uh, it, uh, anger that might be directed towards ourselves or we might direct towards others. Again, something that we might, others may not see in us, but, but nevertheless it's there and it might fester and grow within us. He, he, he speaks about worldly desire. This search for something to meet a need which only God can provide in our life. Jesus uh, speaks about it this way. He, he says when our eye is healthy, when our eye is healthy, when we look at the world around us in a healthy way, understanding it cannot fill what only God can fill, then our, then our whole body, our whole soul is, is healthy. He talks about the neglect of private prayer, which you might think of as, well, I just, I just forgot to pray. But think about it this way with me. Sometimes it might be the fear that God won't hear our prayers or or the fear of what God might reveal to us that we don't want to see about where we are or what we might be dealing with. Maybe it's just that fear that we we tend to have with, with everyone in our life, that fear of intimacy, of really being vulnerable in that place of prayer. Uh, An ignorance or neglect of God's work not seeing that or God's word, a sense of laziness in our life, just falling back into, into the rhythm and routine. Uh, and Wesley even talked about temptation. Even when we persist in resisting that temptation, he talked about that the continual dealing with that creates this, this accumulated exhaustion in our life. And I saw a picture of that, this this morning. So our pastoral and administrative offices are two doors up. On Walnut Creek. Uh, between us is the animal clinic, okay? So if you go that way, you'll see the animal clinic, then you'll see where our, our uh, administrative and most of our pastoral offices are. My office, there's a window that looks out of the, into the backyard of the animal clinic. And it's beautiful. It's just this beautiful, lush, green grass because... It's where all the dogs go. So all day long, this is what I see in my office if my windows are open. Now, if there's no one out there, it's beautiful, it's great, but every once in a while you look over there, and there you go, there's more. So this morning, I sit in my office, and this doesn't often happen, but I guess on the weekends, they have less staff, and, and there's, there's this girl, and she's got two huge dogs. And you know where this is going? <laughs> that are just pulling like, you know, she's trying to pull back on those, on those dogs. And of course, what do you want to do? You want to let go. They're just dragging her around that yard. Sometimes temptation just drags us around. 
and we grow tired. There, 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 there's this exhaustion that, that works into our, into our soul. And here's the effect of that. If those are the causes, here's the effect. When love decreases, so decreases our trust and our faith. As trust and faith decrease, as love increase, so also our capacity for empathy decreases. We don't stop believing that we should love people. It's just that we don't see the need that they have to be loved. We turn inward to ourselves and we, we don't see the needs of those around us. It decreases our joy and our peace. It decreases our power over temptation in our life, we essentially return to bondage as love decreases and fear increases. And all of a sudden, we're walking around so afraid because we've forgotten our name. We've forgotten who we are. So let me give you a real life example. Maybe you've heard it this way, that sin separates us from God. It's the basic Christian foundational idea. Sin separates us from God. But let me, let me illustrate what that looks like for you in relationship with another person. Think about a close friend a close friend in your life, and for whatever reason, because of something you say or do, or something that you don't say or you don't do, there is a change in the relationship. There's a distance that's created, and you actually don't make an intentional decision for this to happen. But, but somehow, th there's just this natural discomfort that enters into the relationship. There's a, there's a hurt which may be minor, it may be large, but you find yourself interacting with them in a different way. And again, it's, oftentimes it's not even something that we have specifically decided to do, but it's just what our heart leads us to do. And maybe, maybe that other person doesn't even know what's happened and they might ask you this question, what's wrong? And our response is typically, eh, nothing. But they know there's something not quite right. And when we say nothing, we actually end up taking another step back. Like the distance actually increases between ourselves and the other person. Hurt reduces love, which leads to further withdrawal, which leads to the decrease of trust and faith. We turn inward to guard. We lose our capacity to empathize. We, we see a, dim, a diminishing amount of joy and peace. That life-giving power that we experience in the relationship decreases. And if nothing is done, the relationship just falls apart. It disappears all together unless we deal with the distance that is created, not because the other person turned out the light, but because we have found ourselves wandering in the darkness, further and further away from one another. And the same thing happens with God. We start wandering away from God because of these particular causes, and all of a sudden, we are wandering around in the dark, trying to find our way, way back. So, Here's the question, what's the cure? What's the cure to this sickness of the soul, of fear increasing our life and love decreasing in our life? If you wanna write down just this note, Psalm 139, 23 through 24. Those words are just a beautiful prayer that leads us into a posture of self-reflection to deal with this in our life. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So there's some questions I'm going to put up on the screen. If you don't have any way to write them down, grab your phone and take a picture, okay? I really want to encourage you to do this. I'm, I'm, you won't be taking a picture of me. Don't worry. I won't be confused, all right? It's not like, oh, I like that tie. I'm going to get a picture. But I want you to, I would love for you to have these questions with you to take home. Because this is simply a process by which we evaluate the health of our hearts. Well, how much of our heart is filled with fear and how much of our heart is filled with love. So to reflect on the question, how close have I felt to God this week? Sometimes we wander and we don't even realize it. And so we begin with just simply asking, where, where am I in relationship to the one who is light? Have I taken a few steps away this week that I didn't even really recognize? 
Was there something that was said or left unsaid, something done or left undone? This is, this is hard work, but this is, this is essentially looking for what, what are the sins of commission, what sins may have committed that others might have seen or that which they may have not seen, but, but I know nevertheless it was there. Uh, what's the condition of my heart? Is, is pride or anger or bitterness or insecurity, or that, whatever that expression of fear is, does, is that ruling me right now? Is that... Is that directing me right now? What is it that is, that is the fuel in my heart right now? Does, and this is a really, I think this may be the best one to help us think about and identify if there's, if there's something going on. Is, am I feeling empathetic or am I growing more unaware of what's happening around me? Do I see hurt or am I passing by it unaware of what of what might be going on in others lives if you really want to be brave you could ask your spouse or your child or your close friend their opinion on this just be careful because they may be honest with you and who knows what they might say Uh, are you neglecting your relationship with God or engaged are you invested or, or you, are you distancing yourself? Are you weary? Have you been worn down by temptation in your life, whatever it might be, or do you feel, do you feel refreshed? Here's, here's just a couple final thoughts. Number one, this is basic, everybody knows this, but it's helpful to hear. It's easy to get lost in the dark. It's easy to get lost in the dark. So if you are in a place where you are experiencing that, first I want you to hear that you're not alone. The second thing I want you to hear is that we would love to pray for you. And so after the services, all our pastors will be here. We would love to pray for you. Um, The strongest Christians, this is from uh, Tim Keller, one of his quotes, the strongest Christians are the ones most willing to repent. The ones who are most willing to address a sin in their life, confess it to another person, and be released from that. Now, if that happens, especially if someone comes to you with that, here, here's what I wanna encourage you to do. Don't diminish that. Don't say, oh, it's all right, it's no big deal, especially if it's not all right, and it was a big deal. That is an opportunity for you to be a fire hose to refill their heart with holy love. And don't miss that opportunity to speak a word of grace, to say, I forgive you, to to, uh, appreciate the courage they've had in sharing that with you and to respond to that with a word of grace and a word of love to help them to move out of the darkness. Now, last last thing, if you go through that whole self-reflection, well, I, I, I do feel close to God, but, and, and I don't think there's anything that's been sa- said or left unsaid, done or left undone. I, the condition of my heart, I, I, I don't think there's a significant issue there. I, I do sense that I am living with, this, with a, a great capacity for empathy. I'm not neglecting my relationship with God. I've been engaged. I've, I've been invested. Not necessarily weary, maybe a little bit. If you find yourself at the end of that going, I don't know, but I'm still not where I want to be, make sure you come back next week. Because what you might be experiencing isn't darkness, it's heaviness. It's heaviness over the, just what life involves. And what we want to do as we continue pursuing this idea of maturity is talking about some of the things that we don't normally talk about. And in doing so, hopefully, help one another to continue moving forward to being filled with love and for fear to be driven out of our life. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, we have celebrated the gift of Easter and our celebration of that still continues. Of what it means for us in our life that new life is now here and available 
And at the same time, Lord, coming down from the high and beauty and joy of Easter, we're reminded, Lord, that, that following you, while it's the best way to live, it's not the easiest way to live. And we all find ourselves stumbling. We all find ourselves sliding back. We are prone to wonder. We feel it to leave the God that we love. And, and I pray, Lord, for every single person here that if nothing else, they might hear today that they are not alone. This is the reality of what it means to follow you. Help us, Lord, in courage to take the steps we need to take to be refilled in our hearts and in our souls with that love that calls us beloved, grounding us in who we are according to what you have done on our behalf. And all this we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.